Hi, I'm Kenneth and this is Common Hawthorne. Welcome to my channel or welcome back. Today I'm doing a video response to Lisa Papez. Her tag is Tarot FAQ and it's a whole bunch of questions. Some of which I prepared for and some of which I'm going to answer kind of off the cuff. So about decks, what are my thoughts on illustrated miners versus pips? And I like illustrated cards. I've not learned uh, or no, I've not studied Marseille much, so I can kind of fall back on numerology, but I don't really have a, an established system, so that's kind of flaky, and sometimes I'll like relate it to um, illustrated kind of weight, writer weight, um, Smith, um, I never can remember... It's Pamela Coleman Smith. So Smith's the important name. Um, anyway, sometimes I'll relate the card to what I remember of that kind of imagery, whether hers or whether it's been interpreted by others. But even like here's the spacious tarot, and you know, that's that's pretty pippish. But um, but aesthetically, I like the fact that they are in fact illustrated and not. Um, not just not just pips. How do I feel about keywords? I don't really mind keywords uh, if they kind of don't jive with what I think. I grew up with advertising, so it's easy to ignore them. The one thing I don't really like here's the five cent tarot, um, and the keywords in it are actually so small that it, it's difficult to read them. So. I don't actually find them very useful, so I don't use this deck much um, specifically for that. Although this is a deck that it's kind of clever how it's worked into the design and for the reversal, then, you know, the keywords are read that way up. Um, anyway, so there's that. How do I feel about borders? Usually fine. Um, there's some decks where I just feel like they're crying out to be trimmed, uh, that the, you know, having the white border was an economic choice about the expense of uh, bleed when you print, which is when the color, the ink goes beyond the edge of the final product. And, um, you know, that has all sorts of implications for how big the original artwork has to be. And, are you actually trimming off some of the original artwork if, for instance, you're using repurposed art? Um, but then there are times when the, the borders really bother me. So this is the Keymaster Tarot, which I just got. It was a, a Kickstarter. And so there are you know, different styles of borders depending on what part of the deck it is. And this is kind of the standard... Um, deck and those those borders are just fine but then I also bought a little tiny pocket version and you know understandably it, it, you know the metallic there's no metallic printing on the back there's no metallic edges um, but I really don't like these white borders those black borders were really beautiful I do not like the white borders and so trimming a deck this small would be an awful lot of work <laughs> um, and the drawing style is such that the you know there's a rule around the image and that plays a role so um, I think cutting it off, I, I'm not sure that I would like that very much. So who knows what I'll do with those. But uh, sometimes the borders actually bother me. And other times I've cut them off just because I felt like it. Which make what makes me decide to modify a deck? Well, so here is Terra of the Master, uh, Le Scarabio, Um that back when I was pining for a Corte de Taroki and appreciating the shape that the it's nice to have cards with different shapes. Um, I, I cut off the borders. And 
you know, it, it's not even because it's an old Scarabia deck that had the names on one side, so the backs aren't uh, symmetrical anymore. But that doesn't really bother me. I don't look at the backs of the cards all that often. And it did, in fact, give me a nice shape that I was after. Um, I've trimmed the John Bauer tarot because it wasn't really working for me as a as a tarot deck, I I had to keep looking at the little white book to s confirm what the card actually was. Um, the Scarabio on some of their decks, you know, has the little like the little different crowns, and I have trouble distinguishing well which is the king and which is the queen. And um, anyway, I thought that this would work better as a little oracle deck, and so I trimmed it. Um, and sometimes I modify decks just for the aesthetics. Here's the um, spacious tarot, and I edged the I edged the sides just because I like I like how that looks. Then it looks even better on camera. <laughs> um, what kind of cardstock is my favorite? Well, I actually like this quite a bit. Um, I want to be able to hold a deck in my hand and thumb. This isn't really working very well. You know, I like to be able to thumb a card off. So if the, sometimes the decks are small but thick and can actually be harder for me to work with than if they're thinner. So um, I don't really like thick stock and um, I like a semi-gloss or a matte. The um, really glossy cards I don't tend to care for very much. And the rose petal finish, mm, that's kind of iffy. Um, linen is okay. There are I have some linen finished cards that are really beautiful, but I tend to prefer just a smooth, a plain smooth uh, surface to the linen. Where do I go to look for new decks I may want to buy? Mostly uh, YouTube. I discovered TarotTube pretty early on, and uh, I watch the unboxing videos. And um, then I, when I joined Instagram, that's frequently been a source of seeing new decks, uh, especially with the Indie Deck Review, doing little capsule reviews and showing several cards when um, card creators are actually on Instagram. And so I can go and look at their Instagram and see a variety of cards that aren't just photographed for, say, Kickstarter, but photographed on their table or in their hands. That um, That's a place where I go to look. Um, what has been my best and worst Kickstarter or crowdfunding experience? Well, the Worst and the best are not terror related. The worst is um, Little Big by John Crowley, a World Fantasy Award winning novel. Um, somebody proposed to do a 25th anniversary edition back in the early 2000s, and I backed it in, I think, 2006, and it has yet to see the light of day. Uh, it's bad enough that uh, somebody was able to edit the Wikipedia page and call it a scam. And it hasn't been, nobody has felt deeply enough about that as uh, incorrect to go in and change it. The best were a Icelandic band called Arstyther that I funded their, one of their early albums. And I got a t-shirt that I just adore that um, there was no other way to get it. And also I pledged to the Everyday Messenger Bag, which is a designed as a camera bag, but I've used it for five years steady, just uh, takes a lick and keeps on going. Um, but for tarot, I would say the best experience was the commonplace tarot that Nell Latimer did. And I want to plug the fact that she's doing a second edition and has, uh, uh, you know, pre-orders up now. And, um, I really hope that 
that she can fund her the second edition of her deck, which is she's uh, largely removing the black border so that the images are, fill more of the card. How do I decide what decks I want to buy or back? Um, sometimes it's fear of missing out, um, in all honesty. Um, sometimes it's that they're very pretty. Sometimes there's something particular about the deck that I want to support, even if I don't think I'm going to use the deck very much. For instance, the um, Morning Calm Oracle that was has just come out. Uh, uh, it's it's a deck that, in the author's own words, in the little white book, is really intended for women um, with an X in it, so that it's inclusive. But um, I'm not a woman in any definition, um, and but you know it has image Korean images. Uh, I knew that there were people who felt like this deck would allow them to see themselves in a card deck and that that's important to support. And so I might do that. Um, I've also tended to support cards, that decks where, um, for instance, that are male-centric or uh, gay imagery, even if it's a kind of art that I don't find particularly attractive, and I'm not sure that I'm going to use it, but I want there to be that kind of deck, <laughs> and so I think sometimes it's uh, important to support those. How much is too much to spend on a deck? Well, I've spent in the mid three figures, so um, I'm probably not a good person to ask. <laughs> um, but in general, I would say, you know, when a when a deck starts to get above sixty or seventy dollars, or you know, sixty or seventy euros on Kickstarter, then I start to wonder. Um, I've paid more than that for Kickstarter packages, depending on what the extras are. And for a mass market, you know, I think 30, 40 bucks is where they should usually be priced. Often decks that are more expensive are actually made more expensive by the addition of things that I don't want or need or may actually dislike. So there's that. Uh, do I have deal breaker cards or cards that have to feel right for me to buy the deck? And um, there's certainly cards that it's not like there's a, there are specific cards I look at. Although I do look at like I look at some of the gendered cards: lovers, two of cups, three of cups. Um, the Devil card, um, to see how like, the gender binary and families and relationships are signaled. And I've done some videos where I look at decks specifically at those cards. Um, but sometimes there's a, there's a card that will just like really turn me off. There is, um... Let's see, I think it's the Del Toro Tarot. One of the cards is like a baby or a fetus in a bottle, and it's just like, um, that, it was just like, oh, I really like some of the aesthetics of the rest of the deck, but that card would just, that would just ruin it. Um, so yeah, there are cards that make might make me feel better about a deck and then in terms of a, a specific cards it's usually in fact a specific card that has some image that I just think I don't want to come across that um, and in fact they're in oracles there have been a couple of times where I've thought well I can go ahead and get that because I can always remove that card um, so reading style do I have a daily tarot practice I wish um, but 
I have at times, and usually I it's been a a one, a two, or a three card pull. Um, there's a two card pull that somebody who's no longer apparently making YouTube videos described as like the first card you pull in a day is the um, kind of the gestalt of where you are right then. And the second card is the energy that's right in front of you that you can either trip over or you can pick up and use. So I've done that sometimes and um, sometimes a three card um, pull without a past, present, future, but just like this is a snapshot. How do they go together? My go-to shuffle style. I riffle shuffle. I'm trying to teach myself to bridge because I've always thought it was cool and I finally decided, damn it, I am going to learn how to bridge. So uh, I like to riffle and bridge. Um, I'll do overhand shuffling if I need to because the cards don't uh, riffle shuffle riffle shuffle well. Um, I don't I don't feel like I'm very good at that and it doesn't feel like it is mixing the cards very much. So it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm it's like if it's an oracle deck or a, a kind of reflection deck and I'm only going to pull one card just to reflect on it. Well, then it doesn't really matter so much how thoroughly it's been mixed. If it's a deck that I've just done a multiple card spread with, well, then I feel like I really want to riffle shuffle it several times to get those cards spread out um, through the deck. How do I choose which deck I'm going to work with? A couple of times I've tried looking at a like the month ahead and setting out specific book uh, decks. Um, for a while, I was selecting a deck, you know, intuitively, I guess you would say, every night so that in the morning, that that's like one less step. <laughs> Back to that, do I have a daily practice? If there's, if, if I've already chosen the deck, then it makes it easier instead of launching into the day. I don't have to decide. I already decided what deck I'm going to use. All I have to do is pick it up and shuffle it and put intention into it and draw the card. Do I purchase professional readings for myself? I have, and I have appreciated them personally, but also as a learning experience. And I expect that I will continue to do that. Do I use tarot for anything other than divination? Yes. Um, I have a friend that I have a prayer agreement with, and the form that that takes for me is uh, taking the deck that I've selected and uh, as I shuffle, holding her in my mind, and I pull a card, and it's not about divination. It's the card might or might not provoke some particular thought about uh, my friend, but she didn't ask me to read her cards um, so that it I don't consider divination. It's an it's a focal point for bringing my friend to mind. And um, then I use them for self-reflection some. And I'd like to do more of that, um, kind of more of the actually taking a card and both studying the card, but using the that study to uh, look at a particular parts of my life by intention, so that I select a card rather than um, finding them at random. Um, reading for clients, well, I don't. So, uh, how do you know when? How did you know you were ready to read for clients? I haven't taken that step yet. Uh, do I do anything special to set up for a client reading or for myself? Not particularly. I am sitting at my desk. That's where I usually read. So it's often just like shoving the keyboard back. Sometimes I will get a cloth to lay down. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. If I am not feeling particularly focused... 
I will spend more time shuffling. So I think that shuffling is uh, an entry into the space of openness where I can um, read the cards. Do you let your client handle your cards? Um, and it's like, yes, I let people handle my cards. Uh, they're, I, I don't think that they're um, like sacred or special or, I mean, they're, they're cards. And um, to the extent that I might have or come to have like negative associations with somebody, um, there are ways that kind of can break that um, mental connection. I don't think that the cards themselves are actually changed by ritual. I think it's that I might be changed by a cleansing ritual or something. So I can always do that if I come to find that I don't like the fact that somebody touched a card. Um, are there any questions I would refuse to answer for a client? Yes. Uh, you know, health. Um, I, at this point, um, don't think that I would do any kind of a third party reading. Uh, I can't imagine doing uh, a fortune telling. I just don't approach the cards as something that um, tell me what the future or even particular futures. Um, I use them for self-reflection and so that's the kind of question that I would be open to engaging with another person, whether they were paying me or not, is around uh, self-reflection. Do I have any advice for people who want to start reading professionally? You know, actually I do. Find a niche and um, get really good at it and good at communicating what that niche is because that's part of how I, as a client, will decide that um, that I'm going to pay you for a reading is if I have some indication of consistency. Um, do you have five minute readings? Do you give 20 minute readings? Do you give an hour and a half? Is it, are they wordy? Are they tight? Uh, are they fortune telling? Are they self-reflection? Do you use a variety of cards? Do you use one card, um, one deck, you know, um, those are things that have an effect on whether or not I would choose to engage somebody as a reader. And so for me, it's like I, I'd like want to have some idea what I'm getting. So that even though I don't read professionally, that would be my advice. Um, figure out what you're good at and what you like doing and do it and communicate what that is clearly. So this was fun. I hope you had fun. Uh, if you like this, subscribe, hit the like button, and um, I hope to see you again. This is Kenneth at Common Hawthorne. Bye.